Okay, so having talked about electronegativity, we're going to start bringing a lot of pieces together here to talk about um, what this means. So electrons spend more time near the atom with higher electronegativity, like I said. Um, so a bond between atoms with different electronegativities creates a bond, electrons being shared unequally. So the contrast here is, remember I showed two fluorine atoms, and because they have the same electronegativity, because they're both the same element, they're going to share these electrons exactly equally. There's not, one is not kind of keeping them more for themselves. But the difference between hydrogen and fluorine, actually hydrogen is a weird one, which I'll come back to in a little bit. Um, let's say nitrogen and fluorine. If we look on the periodic table, um, I'm not even going to try to do that because that molecule doesn't really make any sense, but a hypothetical bond between nitrogen and fluorine. Fluorine gets more of the electrons. What really happens is it looks more like this, where fluorine has a higher concentration of the electrons. It's sort of pulling them away from nitrogen. We call this a polar bond, a polar covalent bond. This is a nonpolar bond bond. Nonpolar, meaning they're shared equally. Polar, meaning they're shared unequally. I'll explain where that word comes from. If you think about it, if you have, let's go back to hydrogen. Same thing. Hydrogen will also be polar. Hydrogen, if the electrons are being pulled away from hydrogen and closer to fluorine, then it's not really true that in sort of in this localized area around hydrogen, you don't have a plus one and a minus one, right? The electron's only spending some of its time there. Now, the electron moves very fast. So much so that it just kind of looks like a blurred out average. So this is why we can sort of, in a way, have fractions of electrons. The fr electrons aren't going to you know, be fractions on a whole molecule. but it's only sort of providing a part of its charge here. And it's providing more charge over here, right? So fluorine, if they were shared exactly equally, fluorine would have one, two, three, four, five, and then kind of half of the time of the two, and it looked like seven, it would be neutral. But this fluorine has like one, two, three, four, five, and a little bit more than two are more than half of two. So it's actually a little negative. It's not a negative one charge, right? It hasn't completely taken that electron from hydrogen, but it kind of has. It's getting more than its fair share. So when I, this little thing that looks like a half note over here, this is a lowercase, it's Greek letters, delta, and then lowercase delta. It just means a difference in charge. It just means there's an imbalance means that there is some, we're not going to define how much negative charge on this side of the molecule. And there's a positive charge over here, but we're not going to say how much. Now, because the molecule has to be neutral overall, this and this are the same magnitude, but the more electronegative ele uh, element becomes slightly negative. It makes sense. Electro that's where the word electronegativity comes from. So the other way we show this is with a, an arrow. An arrow, and the arrow always points to the negative end. And so I, to help, me remind, help, myself, help me remind myself, I put a little like hash on the um, positive end. And actually, that's actually what you're supposed to do. But that's the positive end over here. So this shows that there is a positive, or a negative end over by the fluorine and a positive end over by the hydrogen. And this is like the poles of a magnet. This is where we get polar from. So polar means it has an imbalance and therefore it has a negative pole and a positive pole. So polar co uh, a polar covalent bond results in unequal charge distribution. And so the more electronegative element gets a little bit of a negative. The, electro the less electronegative gets a little bit of a positive, And we show the arrow. So. The extent of polarization depends on the difference in the electronegativity. So let's consider um, hydrogen. Um, I like hydrogen as an example because hydrogen is um, so hydrogen is a little bit out of order in the electronegativity, and I'll talk about where it falls a little bit later. 
But hydrogen is the least electronegative nonmetal. So it, it gets bullied by everything. So hydrogen versus fluorine and hydrogen. Actually, I, don't really, I already use fluorine. Let's do something else. Let's use hydrogen and bromine and hydrogen and chlorine. So in both of these cases, as I just said, hydrogen is less electronegative than everything. So in both cases, it's going to lose out. The arrow is going to go to the right, to the, the halogen. Now, if we look at it, bromine is more electronegative than hydrogen. So is chlorine. The question is, which one of the which in which one is there a bigger difference? Now, it turns out it turns out that um, you know we can measure this. We can look at these, and we can look at the. Uh, location on the periodic table of both bromine and chlorine and compare them. So in both these cases, hydrogen has some fixed electronegativity. Bromine and chlorine, which one is more electronegative? Hopefully you said chlorine because it's higher up on the periodic table. And so bromine being lower down is less electronegative. So they're both going to be negatives, right? Oops. Ah! Can't stop this. Can you stop this from happening? All right. Oh, that was my problem. Got it. All right. Oh no! I lost my drawings. Hold on. Oh, sorry for all the technical difficulties. Okay. So bromine is going to be slightly negative. Hydrogen will be slightly positive. Chlorine will also be slightly negative, and this hydrogen down here will be slightly positive. However, it will be a greater difference. So I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger. Or another way we can show it is I'll show an arrow, but I'll show a bigger arrow down here. In other words, both, both of these are ways of showing that there is a bigger difference in electronegativity between chlorine and hydrogen than there is between bromine and hydrogen. And we actually have a chart in our, in our books where we have some numerical values associated with electronegativities. Um, I will bring that up on the screen here. Okay, so here is a chart. It's not amazing quality, but it will totally work for our purposes. So um, given the previous example that I was talking about, I had hydrogen and chlorine and... Ugh. All right, hydrogen and chlorine, and hydrogen and bromine. And what's important is, so we have this, this, these numbers, these values, and they're, they don't really have any units. They're just set up with fluorine having an arbitrary 4.0, and everything just scaled to fluorine. So, you know, something that has a 2 is like roughly half as electronegative as fluorine. It's all relative. Um, but what we can do is we can compare the numbers, the differences. So if I take the more electronegative uh, elements, electronegativity, minus the less, or just take the absolute value of the difference, and you'll get um, a value. So if I take chlorine minus hydrogen, so you see hydrogen is 2.1. So chlorine would be th uh, this, the electronegativity in this difference in this bond is 3.0 minus 2.1, which is... 1.9. Mm, I think. Nope. Wrong. Bad math. 0.9. <laughs> Bromine is 2.8 minus 2.1, which is uh, 0.7. And so there is a greater electronegativity difference between chlorine and hydrogen than bromine and hydrogen. And therefore, this bond is more polar and has greater charges than this bond. Okay, so seeing this chart of electronegativities now, we can take a 
memorize or know these. All I want you to know is the trend and the few things I'm going to tell you. Because there's some weird, like, little exceptions. Like, I said that hydrogen was least electronegative, but eh, arsenic is less. And I'm just, we're not going to really fuss with those things. Um, just knowing the basic trend is certainly good enough. Now, um, what we can do, and also I'm not going to ask you to calculate this. I'm just showing this as a general kind of to get the conversation going. So if the electronegativity difference is between 0 and 4, or 0.4, then we call that a nonpolar bond. So I think where this is going to be most critical and most important is to understand hydrogen and carbon, the difference is exactly, so 2.5 minus 2.1 is 0.4. So carbon and hydrogen are a, non, that makes a non-polar bond. There's no, there's not enough electronegativity difference for there to be a real measurable charge. Anything greater than that, so hydrogen with just about anything else more electronegative than carbon, is going to give us a polar uh, a polar bond. So the next step step is anything from a 0.4 difference to 2.1 is what we call a polar covalent bond. Now I want to make it clear there's not this definite boundary right at these numbers. These are sort of guideposts, general markers. Um, it's not like it goes instantly and completely from being non-polar covalent to polar covalent right at the 0.4 mark. Right. What this means is this is polar, but not extremely so, not very, not enough to count. And this is starting to matter, but it's still pretty low at the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 difference. Right. It's just not, it's polar, but not very polar. So um, this accounts for most of the interactions between nonmetals. Most of the nonmetals are within 2.1 units of electronegativity of each other, and that's why we get covalent bonds. But it's important to understand that these polar covalent bonds are something of a hybrid between, you know, covalent sharing exactly peacefully and um, ionic, where one atom steals electrons from the other. So it's a gradient all the way from zero all the way up to whatever our highest difference is. I think that would end up being like 3.3 .3 or something. It's this gradient tending from perfectly covalent to totally ionic. But most in the middle, they have some, some sort of blended characteristic of the two. Anything greater than 2.1 we call an ionic bond. I'm, this isn't going to change our definition. We are still going to consider metal, non-metal interactions um, to be ionic, even though you could probably come up with some metal, non-metal interactions that have less than a 2.1 electronegativity difference. Uh, I don't, I'm not terribly interested in hashing that out. Um, what I'm getting at, again, is that realistically, at, even at this end of the spectrum, ionic compounds, there's some kind of covalent character. Down here, most covalent bonds are kind of an ionic character. But if you, get, if you get far enough away from each other in electronegativity, what happens is we consider the electron to have completely transferred. Now, it may be spending a little of its time over on that cation, but not enough for us to consider it. It's just considered to be completely transferred. So these are just guideposts to kind of get the idea in your head. I'm not going to ask you to do anything with the numbers. I just want you to know the trends. We're still going to consider non-metal, non-metal interactions to be covalent. We're going to consider uh, metal, non-metals to be ionic, even though I'm sh there are exceptions you can find. But what's important, what's really critical about this, the thing I want you to take away from this is understanding when you look at a bond between, say, sulfur and oxygen, understand that even though it may be a slight electronegativity difference, oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur, and therefore there's a uh, a net pull that way, where we have a slight negative on the oxygen and a slight positive on the sulfur. That's what's important out of all this.